Hey guys, welcome back. Well, we're at the end of galaxy season, or was it cloud season? I can't remember. I only have four targets to show, but I thought I'd go through and review the galaxies and the images I took, as well as the performance of the ASI 294MC, which has been out a while, so this is not new news. I've been using it with the Antlia tri-band filter, trying to protect against some of the light pollution and possibly some moon glow, and I thought I'd share with you what I found throughout this process. Let's get started. This is a reminder of the equipment that I'm using. I've got my Celestron C925, along with the focal reducer, the Celestron focal reducer, which is not that great. I'm getting an effective focal length of about 13, 18 millimeters under Bortle 8 skies. And I've got it sitting on top of my Skywatcher EQ6R mount, which is still doing very well. I need to do a follow-up video on the performance of this mount, but I'm still enjoying it very much. It's a great mount. I'm using the ASI 294MC now with my C925, and in this particular case, for galaxy season RGB targets, I'm using the Antlia Tri-Band Ultra filter, which with the camera and the effective focal length, I'm getting about a 0.724 arc seconds per pixel image scale with this setup. I'm using the off-axis guiders. So let's run off-axis guiders. are pretty good units. Heavy, it's big, but it allows independent positioning of the guide camera and the imaging camera, which is nice. And I'm using the ASI 174mm along with that off-axis guider. The ASI 174 has a bit larger pixels than the ASI 294, so my image scale is a 0 0.917 seconds per pixel, which is more than enough, more than adequate for this setup. For software, of course, I'm using Nina and Green Swamp Server to control the imaging session, and I have PhD2 doing the guiding. I use ASTAP for plate solving and Stellarium for session planning and PixInsight for processing. I know we've all had pretty bad weather over the past several months, and for me, I was only able to get four targets done plus one supernova in that time. I think I started with this imaging with this setup about in early March and finished up by the end of June. And in that time frame, as I said, just four targets. So it's not a very impressive haul of imaging going on here in this particular galaxy season. I started off with the Leo triplet and got about 19 hours before it finally moved on out of the way with the delays that I had with the weather. Then started picking up N101, able to spend about half of my time before the supernova was noticed, and then picked up some more hours to make sure that I got the supernova included in the picture with M101. Then took on M94, the Croxi Galaxy, about 26.8 hours on that, and 27.8 on M101. So that's about my target range, which is what I'd like to achieve on Galaxy Targets enter these kind of bright skies. With NGC 6946, the fireworks galaxy, I was able to pull in actually 34.8 hours of imaging time on it, mostly because I was trying to image it along with another galaxy and sharing time on those two targets in the final phase of this galaxy season. All this data gives me a reason to go back and experiment while I get back into the swing of one-shot color processing. I mentioned in an earlier video that I was seeing this gradient after a couple of images I took with the Antlia tri-band filter, and it caused me to think that, gee, maybe I'm actually seeing a gradient coming in from the ZWO filter drawer, which just happened to be off on the edge of the frame here, so I thought perhaps that was the source of my image gradient, and in fact, that was not the case. It turns out that I did buy the new ZWO filter drawer, which they had redesigned because they were having light leakage problems with their first version, but I have the new version. I have since removed the black tape I had around the corners, around the edges of the drawer. There are no issues, so the that I was having was not, in fact, the filter drawer. It was probably just round-to-sky gradients that I'm picking up with this imaging combination. Of course, that still leaves us with the gradient, and we still have to remove it to do our processing. So let's go over to PixInsight. Let me show you some of the things that I was running into when I started processing these images, and maybe it'll save you some time. The first obvious thing we do in PixInsight is to remove the background, and I have already selected a ton of points. This is what I like to do. I like to select a lot of points so that no one area gets overrepresented and I have a number of points that can properly characterize the gradient in all portions of the sky. You'll notice I am staying away from this zone where I have these star halos outside of M94. I don't want to get that confused with gradients. Let's just take a look at this image. When we see an image like this, and we have our points, our sample points spread out. We're not seeing any red points here. For example, if I had dialed this back 
to 0.5, which is the default value for the setting here, and we do a resize, you can see I pick up some red samples over here, meaning those won't be used in calculating the background. Well, I don't want that. I want it to calculate the whole background. And so if I crank this up to one and then do a resize, those red sample points turn into blue and we're, we should be good to go. So if I run this, and I'm using a subtraction here for the image correction method, if I run this, I'm going to get a background that it came up with. We can do a stretch on that. And it's kind of nondescript, some reds and some greens, of course. But if we do a stretch on this, one of the issues I have with this is that I was finding that I was getting some correction. Certainly this area over here looks corrected, but this area is not. Why is this green gradient still there? Well, let's take a look at what's happening here. If I go back to the original image, and instead I break it up into the RGB components. Now we have all three channels. I'm just going to stack them up over here. And we'll apply DBE to each one of these. You can see here's my red channel. I'm going to apply the DBE. And if we look at this, we will have, it seems to be a fairly well corrected image here. We didn't have too much wrong with the red channel in the first place. We don't need to look at the background. That's what we get for a red channel. I can eliminate this. And now let's bring up, in this case, the blue channel. And it's in the blue and the green channels is where we're having that residual gradient still hang around. So now if I crank in the DBE, you can see what's happening here. Even though we were getting in our RGB image, we were getting all blue sample points, meaning they were all okay. In fact, they weren't all okay. They were just okay for one of the three channels in that RGB image. You can see here that what's was happening is that the DBE is ignoring all of the sample points in red here, which is basically where all that high intensity blue is. So we actually have to come over here and kick up the tolerance level, do a resize, and take a look at it. I've got a couple of sample points down here that aren't quite being captured. If I want to capture those, maybe I can crank it up again. And we can see, yes, that takes care of it. And now I can go ahead and run dynamic background extraction on the image. And we can get out of dynamic background extraction. Let's park that up here for now, do a stretch on that. And you can see it looks a lot better. And our background looks like this. And you can see there's a lot of bright area here on the left side of the frame that we weren't getting out for because dynamic background extraction was ignoring all of those samples. And if we repeat that with the green channel, we'll find almost exactly the same thing. And I'll run it again. Again, you can see it's ignoring all of those points. I'm going to crank this up to 2.5, just like I did with the blue resize the points and they are all okay now i will run. and you can see that that looks pretty good as well and if we go back to the background again we have that bright area here on the left that we're now getting rid of so now we've gotten rid of the gradient in all three of the composite colors and now it's just a matter of bringing the colors back together again which of course we can do with channel combination so if i iconize that that comes green and put that in there. This is blue. I'll iconize that and put that in the blue tab. And finally, we have red and I can iconize that and that can go here. And now you can see we've done a much better job. And here's what we had before. So before we took the image apart into its components and applied the dynamic background extraction to each one of the RGB components and then recombine, we had this big blue green area over here on the left that we no longer have. We still have some gradients. The center part is what I wanted to hold on to because that's useful signal, but this stuff over here is noise and I wanted to get rid of that and we have for the most part. For the rest of it, we can take care of that in post-processing. So that's just one of the issues that I found I had to deal with when using the one-shot color images and dynamic background extraction with this large gradient. Okay, let's go take a look at the workflow that I'm experimenting with now that I'm back into one-shot color photography. One of the things that I'm trying is to take four image stacks. As I complete the imaging each night, what I do is calibrate the images and then debayer them and then feed them through subframe selector. And then that gives me the values of the full width, half maximum, and eccentricity. I then use those two numbers to calculate the maximum full width, half maximum, something I've talked about in other videos. I won't go into it here, but that gives me a 
value for the full width at half maximum that includes more of the effect of the eccentricity. So it's kind of a more heavily weighted version of full width at half maximum that includes the a greater effect of eccentricity. Once I find the values of the full width at half maximum, I then have a program that goes in and appends that full width at half maximum minus the decimal point here and just adds that to all of the file names so that now when I go into this directory of now registered images, I know which images are the best, at least according to this metric. I want to go through and construct four different image stacks. I can select all of the images, which includes the best image here and the worst image at the bottom of the stack, and create a stack of that. I can get a stack representing the best 75% of the images, the best 50% of the images, just highlight the first half of this file list, and the best 25%, highlight the first 25% of the file list, and that gives me four image stacks with different characteristics. For example, in the case of the 25% best, I'm getting a lot of noise, but I'm also getting the best shaped stars. In the case of the all image stack, I'm getting much reduced noise, but I've lost some detail because I'm including images that have a larger full width at half maximum. And then, of course, I've got a couple here in the middle. Well, with the first one, I only care about the stars here. With this image stack, the stars are as small and as tight as I have in my set of data. Also, I don't care so much about the background noise because I'm only interested in the stars. So I'll just extract the stars from this image, use StarNet, use some color saturation and try to improve the color in the stars, but it's just a stars only image. For the two in the middle here, I'm gonna pick one of these two and just extract the luminance and that'll use that for my detail. And I'll use Bohr Exterminator with some other sharpening processes such as the high dynamic range, uh, multi-scale transform, or uh, unsharp mask, etc., to improve the detail within just this luminance only image. And then in the final image, which has all of the images, including some of the bad images that I collected, I'm just going to use this image for color. So I'll hit this with a good dose of noise exterminator, apply some curves, play with saturation, try to bring the color out a bit. And then when I get done with these two starless images, I'll combine them using LRGB combination. So now I have a the details superimposed on the color that we got out of our all images stack. And then, of course, I just combine this image with the stars. I blend the stars in. This is a script I wrote some time back. There's a video on it. And it just blends the stars from our stars only field into the image here. And then this becomes my final image. So I'm kind of experimenting with this. I'm trying to take the best features of each of the image stacks that I have. Now, is it really better? Is it really producing a better image? I don't know. Too soon for me to tell. We've got to do some more processing and make a comparison. But that's the idea that I'm working with, at least initially, with this one-shot color camera. Before I show you the four images that I got through my first pass in processing the data, I just want to go through and summarize this, and I'll leave you with the images at the end of this video. The thing I wanted to do when I started Galaxy Season was to compare Galaxy images, which are RGB targets, taken with the L Pro and then compare that to what I get with the Tri-Band Ultra Filter. Well, it turned out I just didn't have enough clear skies over the over this Galaxy season to justify repeating a target. Didn't want to waste any imaging time. So I left the Tri-Band Ultra in the filter drawer throughout the whole Galaxy season. And I usually use the SCT at its full focal length, but I wanted to see if I could get better results with the focal reducer and just capture some of these larger targets, Galaxy clusters such as the Leo Triplet, so this gives me a chance to play with that. Even though I did my level best to get the right back focus, the stars are badly stretched in uh, some of the corners. I'll discuss that in a follow-up video. I'm really seeing that with some of the nebula targets I've taken recently. A lot more stars to look at. One of the things that I was concerned about in taking this approach with the one-shot color camera and using a filter such as the tri-band or a dual-band filter, I was concerned about using that highly filtered light for plate solving and for autofocus. It turns out I've had a chance to use the dual-band, at least a dual-band filter, the ALP-T filter, and I haven't had any issues at all. Everything's been working great. When I saw the first images coming up with this setup, I thought that the filter drawer was allowing light to leak into the side and causing that gradient, the bluish green to red gradient we were looking at a little while ago. Uh, in fact, that's not the case at all. It turns out that the filter drawer, the, the new ZWO filter drawer, 
has been redesigned to prevent exactly that thing, and it is working very well. For the Antlia tri-band filter, I think it's working great. I've been using 200-second exposures at a gain of 122. A gain of 120 is where the high conversion gain kicks in. I'm just going over to 122 just to be sure that I'm getting that high conversion gain, and it's uh, working out very well. It pulls out uh, hydrogen alpha very nicely. You'll see that when you see the images of the Fireworks Galaxy and M101. The star colors are also pretty good. Again, you can see that with the Fireworks Galaxy fairly well because there are so many stars in that image. So I'm pretty happy with the color I'm getting out of that. Plus, I'm also happy that I'm getting some protection from moon glow. I did do some of my imaging with a nearby moon. It wasn't that close. It might have been around 45 to 50 degrees away, but I was still able to image and, and did not uh, even consider throwing out those images. Okay, guys. Well, I'll leave you with the images. There's only four, so it won't take too long. I'll check in with you next time. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.